In this time of social distancing, when taking a break from everyday life is critical to everyone's health, there is one thing we can all do together. Complete the 2020 census. Your responses are critical to plan for the next 10 years of health care, infrastructure, and education. Let's make a difference together by taking a few minutes to go online to 2020census.gov. It's for the well-being of your community and will help shape America's future. remember when I knocked him down the first time, I knew from experience that, and I'd seen Frazier, if you hit him, he only, you know, he likes it. And I thought, man, I knocked him down. What did I do that for? Then he gets up. I said, I better knock him down again. I said, you really messed up now, George. Oh, you messed up. And so I just kept knocking him down. Then they called the fight off. After six times, they uh, crowned me heavyweight champion of the world. But I kept thinking, Joe Frazier, I knocked him down, but he got up six times. Patty Smith with the Harris County Houston Sports Authority, and welcome to this week's episode of Queued Up. The queue, of course, up until this point has been for quarantine, and while that has been loosened up a little bit, we hope you're still all staying safe, stopping the spread, staying home, but that you are enjoying some of our episodes, some of the great content we've been providing you here on this show. It's been a great five weeks or so. You've seen conversations with Jeff Bagwell, Alex Bregman, Whitney Merciless, Roger Clemens, and to this point, we've had nearly a half a million viewers tune in. We want you to continue to do that. In fact, if you haven't already liked us on Facebook or followed us on Twitter, do that now. That automatically enters you into the contest to win tickets to the upcoming Houston Sports Awards. All right, we'll also be showing videos a little bit later on at the end of the show with our partners from the Houston Outlaws. Videos of what you've been doing at home to game together, so stay tuned for that. But now, up next, he's a two-time heavyweight champion of the world. He's from Houston, and many of you know him as the inventor of the lean, mean, fat-reducing grilling machine. He's George Foreman, and he's queued up. All right, George, welcome to Queued Up. Um, everybody queued up, Q course, being quarantined here in these very strange times. Where are you and what are you and your family doing during all of this? Well, we're down on a ranch in Marshall, Texas. And we've, I told my, uh, my family, boy, I had this place since 1976. And I've often thought it was just comfortable home, but what about family? Come to find out the whole family is here now. So it was needed for that one moment in time. Yeah. So, well, you're and your whole family, that's a big family. So you've got a lot of kids. They're all down. There's a lot of houses here. So everybody's separated. But at the same time, we're all together. I mean, these are just such strange times. I mean, what, what's your take on all of this? I'm just happy to be alive because I've often known that if you if you live, you're gonna run into what, what what is called strange times. It's just gonna happen, and there's no way out of it. And uh, I've been living wow, 71 years. So it right. makes you understand. Uh, never be surprised at what happened. Yeah. Well, 71 years, and I I want to you know hit on a few of the high points um, of that. Uh, just such a colorful career, colorful like your shirt. We were just talking about before we went on, but um, you know you are a native Houstonian, grew up in the Fifth Ward. You know, kind of take us back to that time. Um, just you know what 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 that time was like for you, your childhood, and some of your earliest memories. Ah, oh, boy, when you think about Houston and Fifth Ward, the first thing that come to mind. What was really strange and scary was Hurricane Carla. I can remember in the house we were living in. And you look back, 
how in the world did we survive in that little house and that big wind? And then, of course, it was the happiest time of my life because a bicycle was a, was a luxury that I didn't have, but every now and then a friend would let me borrow one. And so it brought forth happiness. Oh, and the taste of breakfast. <laughs> oh, and lunch. Nothing like it. That's what I can remember about the childhood. I, you know, you hear the stories about it. it was so tough and times were tough. You had to be tough. But I can all, that's almost vanished. It's the, the splendor of being a kid in Fifth Ward and lunch. Wow. Well, isn't that amazing? Because, you know, to your point, when you hear, you know, you've got everything in the world now at your fingertips, all the, you know, money, whatever. But you look back to those times when you had nothing and you say those were some of the happiest times of your life. You hear that uh, time and time again. It, it's, it's just kind of ironic, isn't it? Yeah, you happy. I had, and at one time I remember I really got a lot of big bucks. I mean, many bucks, millions. And, uh, and everybody asked me, how does it feel to be rich? Then I think back to Fifth Ward once. I got in trouble with my mom and uh, she had let me get away with it a few times because I, I, I would run away and she had to go to work or something. So I figured I was the fastest kid on the block. One day she decided, you've gone too far. And when I started to run away, she came behind me. And I zigzagged like the football players. She zigzagged in the same way. I said, I can't believe she's going to catch me. So the best thing I could do was jump in a tree and climb, because we kids then had started to climb trees. And I said, she'll never catch me now. <laughs> and I got, thought I was in comfort. And next thing I know, my mom was shaking the tree, shaking the tree. I said, you don't do that, mom. She said, well, come down, young man. I can't believe she's shaking the tree. So when you think about wealth, the, the day that my mom could outrun me, and then she was stronger than I, shaking the tree, that was real wealth. Boy, uh, and it all goes back to Fifth Ward. Were you getting in a lot of trouble? Was she always after you? I was, I was uh, trouble on her hand all the time. <laughs> I don't know why, but my life leaned toward mischief. I was always the problem kid. And so when did, when did you start boxing? And did boxing start to change some of that? Well, probably uh, uh, having a working mom in the lovely fifth ward. <laughs> and uh, so you, she thought I was going to school and I was going to shoot hooky. I didn't want to go to school. I didn't like school. I, my life was not going to be stuck in a classroom. I thought it was going to be forever. I didn't know it was only so, a certain amount of years you go to school. But I got in trouble after school, and next thing you know, the police were chasing me, and I was running from the police. And and uh, and you look up, and you're 16 years old, and uh, I was out of school. My mom gave me good talks and all of that, but finally I dropped out of school, and I heard about a job corps program. It was hyped by Jim Brown and the great Johnny Unitas, football players, quarterbacks, and running backs. And I went to Grants Pass, Oregon by way of the Job Corps. And it was all new to me. Out in the woods, there weren't any lights out there. And it was lonely. I was crying and homesick, homesick all the time. Finally, uh, uh, I heard about a boxing program at another Job Corps Center if I graduated from the Conservation Center. Went to uh, Pleasanton, California and joined the boxing team. First, I wasn't any good at it, but uh, the, uh, the boxing coach said, man, you could be an Olympic gold medalist if, you know, what is the Olympic, what are they? But I stuck with it. Finally, I won a golden glove locally in San Francisco, and it qualified me for the national AAU, national AAU for the Olympic trials. And lo and behold, I was an Olympic gold medalist impossible what can happen in a short period of, uh, period of time. I didn't want to be a boxer. I just wanted to be a street fighter so I could go back to Houston and show those guys what I could do. Next thing you know, I was stuck in it. Never had a street fight after. I guess not. So take us back to those, you know, those Olympics. I mean, obviously it was something that uh, you didn't just happen upon it. I mean, it wasn't your goal, but because of your talent and because of 
the path that you took. You ended up winning that gold medal uh, back in 1968 in Mexico City. And I know, you know, we recently honored you at the Houston Sports Awards, um, inducted you into the Houston Sports Hall of Fame. And you said there that night that winning that gold medal of all your moments when I, we asked you what was one of your most cherished moments, and you said it was that. Yeah, I got on the Olympic team. There were four fights. And uh, I remember how happy I was just to be on the team. And I'd even call my mom and say, you know, nothing else happened. I got my Olympic uniform, jackets and shirts. She said, well, that's nice, baby. Then I'd go on and on. Finally, I was in a bronze medal match. I said, if nothing else, I'm a bronze medalist. I, it just happened that uh, one moment, one my morning, I think for breakfast, or maybe lunch, Bob Beamuth came through and he had this gold medal on his neck. And it was the most mysterious, the most beautiful thing. I said, wow, I sure would like one of those. And there I am in a gold medal match. And I win it after four boxing match. I was uh, I'd going up against a Russian opponent. This was the power back in those days, the superpowers. And I won the boxing match. They stopped it in the third round and uh, gave me the victory and got on that platform. And here come the, uh, your flag coming up and then they play your national anthem. I didn't, it was like, is this a dream? Sometimes now I think it's just a long dream. I'm going to wake up and <laughs> it didn't happen. But it was the first time a dream had come true to me. I had been told by one of my cousins, boy, go back to bed. She called me shooting hooky. Go to sleep. Uh, I said, no, 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 I forgot something because I was, was shooting hooky. She called me getting ready to make truants. I was going to lay back down, but I got embarrassed and left the house. But she told me no one in this family ever becomes anything. I'm not going to tell on you. Just go to sleep. And, and on that night, that night in the Olympics, standing on that platform, I could hear her voice and I laughed back. <laughs> Not true. I'm an Olympic gold medalist and nothing has touched it as an athlete for me to this day. A dream come true. And you know that it's such an iconic picture and that was your Hall of Fame painting in the Houston Sports Hall of Fame was you holding that little flag. What is the story behind that little flag? Well, you in the Olympic Village, you see a guy who looks just like you, really, or someone in your family, a cousin or something, or partner down the street, and you walk up to him and say, "Hey!" And he speaks another language. He's from another country, and you start to think the only thing that differentiate us are the colors we wear. So you always walk around with your colors. So after the fight. Uh, the judges had been crucial. They'd been brutal. They would take fights. Come to find out the international rules were cheat the Americans. That's what they were. So I put a, a small American flag in my pocket along with uh, lucky beads, a lucky penny, and a picture of my a girl I was courting. <laughs> well, I was courting. She wasn't courting me. Anyway, and I said, if I win, this is good, good luck. I'm going to wave the flag and not understanding I'm going to think I'm going to win. But I won that thing and I told them to give my robe to me. And I got the flag out. I said, now they're going to know where I'm from. They may not know me, but I got to show the colors to make certain they know where I'm from. So I bowed to the judges. We got you now. And I waved the flag. And that's what it was all about. I wanted to make certain everyone knew where I was from. That's awesome. So as you start going in your boxing career, uh, Sonny Liston was one of your sparring partners. How much of your style or what did you learn from? What did you take from him? How much did Sonny Liston mean to you? Before the Olympics, it got difficult for me to find big guys to spar and train with. And my trainer came, Doc Brothers came home one day and came to the uh, center one day and said, look, I got a chance for you to work out with Sonny Liston and uh, to spar with you. And I think that you need someone big in the ring to, to practice with. I said, okay. <laughs> I didn't want that, but they had the opportunity presented itself. And he hired me and I went down to spar with Sonny Listen. It was tough, but I made it through it and made me so proud. I thought I could beat anybody down. 
But finally, after the Olympics, I won a gold medal. I chose Dick Sattler to be the trainer, my trainer and manager. And so I'd spar with Sonny Liston daily. And I had to learn that was the only man that could truly, in my boxing career, who could stand up to me. I'd get in the ring with most guys and they were frail and they'd run away and they'd box a cover up, but not Sonny Liston. Ooh, I had to box him. So that proved to be a good experience for me, good, uh, a good confident builder for me. From then on, I thought I could probably beat anyone. And you did. You mowed through them. And, you know, you were so known as one of the hardest hitters ever in the sport. And I'm going to throw a couple of comments from some of your opponents, and I want you to comment back to me on, on your thoughts on what they said. Evander Holyfield said that you hit harder than anyone he ever fought. Oh, what a tough Evander Holyfield. Now, Evander Holyfield, people ask me about him. He could have the guy, the guy was fast. He threw combinations. Then you look to hit him back, and it's like, where is he? Where is he? Then the only way you know where he'd be, he'd hit you 50 more times. And that was a great – to hear him say that is, is amazing. I just couldn't get the right shot off at the right time because of the most fast heavyweight I'd been in the ring with. Boom Boom, Mancini, Boom Boom Mancini said that you beat most guys before they ever even got in the ring. <laughs> well, I wish they had jumped out of the ring before I got in there then. <laughs> but uh, I had to get in the ring and face those guys, and there were some tough ones. I can, from, I can remember every fight, every punch, every round, most every sitting. And so each fight was a challenge for me, and they were tough. And uh, when I'd win, I'd always say, what did happen? Ken Norton said he, when he stepped in the ring with you, he couldn't even look you in the eye. Boy, too bad because I, I'm, I remember getting in the ring with Ken Norton. I'd look across the ring, and this guy had muscles everywhere. He had muscles. People didn't even know where muscles were. And I'm thinking, I don't want to fight this guy. But the fight broke out, and of course, I was uh, fortunate enough to win, but he was one, one of the most built fighters I'd ever seen in the ring. All right, let's go to your first championship. You were 37-0 and 0 at the time, I believe. You had 34 of those were knockouts. Joe Frazier in Kingston, Jamaica. Um, everyone thought Frazier would win. Uh, you had the height advantage. Um, take it from there. Well, Joe Frazier, I saw Joe Frazier box for the first time. Closed circuit. He was fighting Buster Mathis, who was a big man. And Frazier was not all that big, ever. He never was that big. But he got in the ring and jumped on that guy. And no matter what the guy did to him, he's back on him like a termite or something. I kept thinking, man, never seen a machine like that. And finally, I don't know, maybe the 10th round or so, he knocked Buster Mathis out. And I said right then, I don't ever want to fight that thing. <laughs> That's a, something I don't want to be bothered with. I hope he dies. But I want to be champion, but I didn't want to be bothered with Joe Frazier. But as things would go on, I became number one contender. He beat Muhammad Ali, and I was the next in line. He had to fight me. And uh, I remember being afraid, going up, up the steps, so nervous, knees shaking. And here comes Joe Frazier's head moving. And I said, there he is. I kept thinking in Kingston, Jamaica, maybe there will be, uh, maybe there will be a, a, a storm here. Maybe the ring will fall. Maybe it'll start raining. And I won't have to fight. But nothing happened. I had to get in that ring, and I had to fight. Smoking Joe Frazier. Can you imagine someone being called smoking that means there's going to be a fire started somewhere. Yeah, well, and you did. I mean, and, and down goes Frazier. I mean, the, those words live on in infamy. Um, I mean, you're, you're, you, you put him down. You, I don't know if you hear Howard Cosell's words at those times. I know you've heard him a million times since, but you're, you're now the heavyweight champion. What, what's going through your mind? Well, I didn't hear those words, but I remember when I knocked him down the first time, I knew – from experience that, and I'd seen Frazier, if you hit him, he only, you know, he likes it. And I thought, man, I knocked him down. What did I do that for? 
Then he gets up. I said, I better knock him down again. I said, you really messed up now, George. Oh, you messed up. And so I just kept knocking him down. Then the, they called the fight out. After six times, they uh, crowned me heavyweight champion of the world. But I kept thinking, Joe Frazier, I knocked him down, but he got up six times. But so what did that mean to you at that point here? You know, you described the feeling of winning an Olympic gold medal, but for you, that kid from the fifth ward to have that belt, the heavyweight champion of the world. Yeah, it was a lovely experience because we all knew once you become heavyweight champ of the world, you're able to buy anything for lunch and breakfast you want. <laughs> and that's what I thought about. I got it. I got it. He keeps going back to breakfast and lunch. lunch. That's something. So, okay, so then, um, you know, you, let, let's go, I mean, I could talk about a million things with you, but I know we don't have all day on this, but the Rumble in the Jungle, 1974, um, a very different fight uh, in Zaire. I know it got delayed by about 30 days, which probably had some uh, effect on it. You had a cut over your eye that probably, I, I don't want to speak for you, but I know changed up some of the rhythm, but what do you most remember from that fight with Muhammad Ali and, and that era and that time? Yeah, going to Africa, that was great because the people from Africa had come to my home. I was the champion of the world then and tried to convince me to bring the title to Africa. And I said, well, they were so nice and so kind. They even asked me to bring my dog with me and all that. The nicest I've ever felt. So I went to Africa to fight what I felt would be the easiest boxing match in my life. Here was a guy much older and I could punch and I'd knocked out everybody he'd ever faced, it seemed. So I thought, this is going to be the easiest time of my life. So once I got the injury there and uh, the knockout occurred, I thought, I don't care. I don't need anything. I can beat him. I, it doesn't matter. That didn't happen. Well, I mean, the, uh, the fight started, and I thought, easy. He hit me a couple of times, but it was like, shoot, fly, don't bother me. You know I got to knock you out. And I went after him every round, every round. Boom, 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 boom. And uh, it really got tough. I think maybe the sixth or seventh round, I said, I finally got him. I hit him in the sack, and he fell on me. I said, ah. And he fell on me and right on my ear and said, tell all you got, George! Then I realized this is something different. <laughs> it wasn't going to be so easy after all. And then in the eighth round, I was coming after him. He missed me with one shot. Uh, and I fell and turned around to face him. And he hit me with the most fast one-two I'd ever received in my life. So fast, I didn't see it. But boy, was it fast. Knocked me down. And I thought, I get up in a minute here. Then I'm really going to get it. I got up. Rough called the fight off, and I was no longer the beloved. My, I no longer had my beloved championship of the world at all. What did? How did you take that at the time? I mean, devastated. I was. I was when I lost that title. I was devastated because I wanted to be champion of the world so much, and then to lose it, uh, it devastated me for many, many years. And how did you come back from that? Well, they matched me with Ron Lyle. In Las Vegas, Nevada, I thought he was a puncher, but I said, I got to beat everybody to show them, look, that was a fluke. I'm still the champion. So I go to uh, Las Vegas to fight Run Lyle. And uh, he was a puncher, of course, but I was going to box him and let it go. The next thing you know, I'm on the canvas. And I said, wow, what am I going to, what excuses can I come up with now? The ropes are loose. They put something in my drink. I had all kinds of excuses. I said, they're not going to believe this. So I had to get up and I beat him up a little bit. And next thing you know, I'm down again. I'd never been hit that hard in boxing. Never. Because someone would just knock me down and just like I was a piece, maybe a rag or something. But I got up. I said, it's easier to get up and maybe lose my life than to try to explain to my friend and, and the media type uh, some excuse. <laughs> so I fought and fought. Finally, I fought him so hard that he, he fainted, and I won the boxing match. That's, what, that's the way I won that fight. So, and then I know there's a... Then, you know, 
But I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, but I recovered for some reason that little self-esteem and all of the things that trouble me at night, trying to get up in time for that fight, the excuses, they all went away. I was free. Got all the, the, the skeletons out of the closet. I was George Foreman again. I got up, I got up, and that meant everything to me. From devastation to, uh, I don't know, what is a good word from that? Anyway, I was, the guy I wanted to be again, redeemed. Well, and then, you know, a couple things on that. I mean, you, there, it seems like to me there's, and I don't want to go totally off track here, but it almost seems like there's two George Foremans. You know, the, the young George Foreman that seemed like you were just, you know, you were just mean. And sometimes you, you see that in you. And then over the years, and I don't know if that's when it changed with the George Foreman grill or whatever, but you became a, and I think in the boxing world too, just a, 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 a people's champion almost people you became so much more liked and your personality seemed to well i had you know i had a, a really uh experience in 1977 that really changed me you know i'm a minister to this day the church of the lord jesus christ i'm a preacher that's what i am and i'd go out on the street corners and talk to people about god and how life-changing it could be to find that experience and uh the next thing you know, I'm telling my kids, sit up straight, put a smile on your face. Nothing is that bad. And I started to buy the same product I was selling. I sold to them to be a good person, be a nice guy. And I learned in, in the same time, never a punch in anger. And I had a lot of anger. That's why I left boxing for 10 years. I'd lost the anger. I just didn't have any anger anymore. But then I realized you could be a professional, a good professional boxer. All you needed is to undertake it as a job. Forget about trying to hurt someone. And I learned that now I tell my kids, you may not be the most fast kid in class or the most best runner or jumper, but you can, also, you can always be the nicest human being. And I explained that to them. And that was my goal from that point on. Well, that, you know, at that time, of course, you know, you made a, a multiple comebacks. I think uh, after a decade of being out in 1987, you went for your second comeback. And in that time, was that, and I, I'm not sure of the timing, what, had you already launched the George Foreman Grill at that point when you, for that second comeback? No, for, for 10 years, I didn't box. I didn't do anything. I was mainly an evangelist, of which I still am. And uh, that's all I would do is dedicate my time to, uh, to preaching. For 10 years, I didn't even make a fist or nothing. But at the same time, I lost all my friends. And I found out that could be a lonely place. And I started to cook at home. Cook. Next thing you know, one or two people came by. What you got? After a while, I cooked so much. People loved me. They said, got any more fish? Had more ribs. <laughs> I became, people liked my cooking. And for 10 years, that's who I was. Old George with something to eat. Uh, and then after uh, uh, my comeback and recapturing the title, I, we launched the George Foreman Grill. And uh, that was some time after. Then people know me, even to this day, seem to know more about the George Foreman of the George Foreman Grill than the boxer. I've heard people trying to explain to their children, you know, he was the boxer, he was a champion. And they said, no, that's the cooking man. Yeah. Most people grew up knowing me and had gotten college degrees and everything, knew more about me as the grill person than the boxer. Yeah, that's that's just crazy. So when you came back, and I think your your second comeback, well, you would fought, you fought Holyfield, which you talked about that in 1991. I think you were about 42 years old. Didn't win the fight, but really proved to people that, yeah, he, he still got it. Evander was 28 at the time. But that's when you then had a chance to reclaim that title again against Michael Moore. And what are you, 45 years old at that point? Yeah, that's strange. It was November, and the following uh, January, I would have been 46. But I'm in the ring with the champion of the world at 45, and everybody thought, not going to happen, shouldn't do it. And the, the, all of a sudden, the odds were against me again in the same fashion as it had been with Joe Frazier some years earlier. And uh, 
and the fight had gone some savage 10 rounds, but at the end, I was the heavyweight champion again. I mean, and that's crazy. I mean, people, people have said that that is probably, you know, the most incredible feat ever to, to reclaim or any title at, at, at that age, you had confidence in yourself. I mean, do you agree with that statement that that was probably one of the most athletic feats ever to be accomplished? Yeah, there, there's some things that can happen when you're an athlete and everybody's prepared for you to, but it, it, it's always strange. For me, being told I can't do it has been part of my life all, anyway, but, but it didn't bother me that much. But I think it, it, it made a difference in sports because now guys come back at any age and they prepare and people start thinking maybe he can do it only because of that fight with Michael Moore. That age of the age forty and fifty is not a death sentence as an athlete at all. Well, and I just recently saw some video of Mike Tyson. He's still training. He's still working out. And I don't even know how old he is. But to your point, but here you are, seventy-one years old now. Still, you still uh, train at all? Are you still in shape? Yeah, I'm still in shape. I work out and everything. But my shape is trying to make certain I stay out of the the left kicks from my grandkids. Not left hooks, but left kick. <laughs> so I'm really just keeping my myself in shape to avoid the devastation from my grandkids. Yeah, I know those grandkids. I've heard some of them running around out there, and I know I've asked you this before, and you've answered it a million times. But I want you to tell the people who maybe have not heard the story. You know, you're, you're you've got such a close family, a great family. I've had a chance to you know get to know uh, Leola, your daughter, but. All your boys, so many kids named George. Uh, explain the story there. Uh, it's strange, though, because we had one George, and the next time I said, well, what will the next one say? Why didn't you name me George? So I had three Georges, us three. Then the, the another came. I wasn't, I was I always wanted daughters. The daughter, I love the daughters because they spend time with you. They look after you. and. They just seem to love you. And uh, had another boy, I said, well, we better name him George, too, because he's going to feel, for some reason, he was left out. And it just went on and on. But I really wanted to give them something that they could all hold on to. And I tell them all the time, if one does well, we all do well. But if the opposite, one falls, we fall along with him. And your name is what you need. Uh, so uh, I think the name George Foreman keep us together makes us one. Sometimes I look up and get upset and think, "Well, it is George," <laughs> and everything can be bypassed. Can't tell Lily. Well, you know, it's interesting because your family, you guys, seem so close. You you're all kind of quarantined up there together. And when I hear you tell that original story about when you were a kid and the way that you grew up and hearing no, none of the foremans are ever up to be anything. And yet the way that the message that you pass on to your family is so entirely different. I mean, I'm proud of you for that. You've got to be proud of the family that you have and how that has sort of transpired. Yeah. The, the most lovely thing in the world is the family I've had. You asked me, George, what have you gotten out of this? the whole George Foreman trip at all. And I think, tell you, the most valuable asset are my family. There's something you can't erase, you can't lose. And uh, no matter what, you're close to them, even in your dreams and your nightmare. Everything is about your children <laughs> and your grandkids. And so, and then my wife, of course, who rules the roost. She's here and family is everything. It's not some of it, it's everything. Yeah. Amen to that. So you go out on the street and you mentioned the, the George Foreman grill and how you get recognized when you're out there uh, and people see you, what, when they come up to you, is it all about being the champ? Is it about, Hey, lean, mean, fat machine. What, what, what's it like out there for you today? It, it's a privilege for me too, because remember I had 10 years out and after about three years, no one knew me. I had that cut my beloved Afro off, my mustache, everything was gone. I was just this big guy with overalls, Holland, thank you, Jesus. Ah, and they were like, who is this guy? And they passed me by. <laughs> I knew what that was all about. And uh, so I went years with nobody know noticing me. And I went to a Houston Rockets game. 
I think Ralph Sampson had just been drafted. And I went to see that tall kid. And someone walked up to me and said, hey, I know you. And I thought, I was so proud. They said, Refrigerator Perry. Uh <laughs> Refrigerator Perry. And I thought, man, I am gone. <laughs> so when I got a second chance to get back in boxing, people walk up, can I get your autograph? I was like, I'm going to love this until the end this time. I love being recognized and being asked for an autograph. I love it. I'm not refrigerator Perry. <laughs> Absolutely not. You know, and it's been such a crazy wild ride. You know, you're a World Boxing Hall of Famer, an International Boxing Hall of Famer, um, and, you know, a, a Houston Sports Hall of Famer. And of, of all those things that you said when we inducted you into the Houston Sports Hall of Fame, that that's the one that means most to you. I don't know if that's true or not, but I like it. Is, it, is that is that true? Yeah, because I left Houston, Texas. I wanted to be. Uh, yeah, I left Houston, Texas as uh, as a boy. I left. I said, "No, I'm going to the job call. I think maybe I'm going to be a football player. I wanted to do something with my life." And when I'm, and then when I made the Olympic team. All the media, were, media was there with us daily. And finally, I asked them to find me the local newspaper in Houston. I said, and tell them that George Foreman had made the Olympic team, but they're not going to know you by George Foreman. Know me by George Foreman. Tell them, monkey, big monk, that's what they used to call me when I was walking the street. Tell them I made the Olympics. In other words, it was Houston that was important to me. I wanted Houston my place with my home to know what I had done. And I never expected to receive an award locally like, like I had. And that was the award I'd been seeking all the time. I finally got it. Yeah. George Foreman, Houston, Texas. Incredible. So all that you've accomplished and all that you've done in your career, you, um, you know, and now you're spreading the word, you're preaching, you're, you're doing what, what your heart tells you to do. Is there anything that you want to um, still accomplish or how do you want to be remembered when it's all said and done? Oh, it's not about re being remembered anymore. <laughs> like I said, I got that Houston award. I'm set. I'm set, they call it. That's all. What do they say? Such and such Jack. And that's right, Jack, or something. <laughs> but the point of it is I got what I wanted. I just like to go on and live a happy life watching my kids grow up watching my kids grow up, just that being remembered is for someone who wants to be remembered. I like today. I enjoy today. Well, we enjoyed the visit, and I want to uh, tell you for, you know, thank you for being a part of this, and we are, are partnered with Energy Ogre and Cullen Gillespie, who's a member of the Houston Texans, um, on behalf of Energy Ogre, would like to uh, share this message with you. Thanks, Patty. What's up, champ? My name is Colin Gillespie. I'm number 44 with the Houston Texans. I'm a fullback, so I guess I know a little bit about hitting, but uh, I wouldn't say I'm quite on your level. I think it's awesome what you're doing with MD Anderson. So on behalf of Energy Ogre and myself, we're proud to be making a contribution to help further your cause. Together, we can keep fighting the good fight. Thanks. Thank you, Colin. Thank you so much. Thank you, MD Anderson. Yeah. Again, George, thanks so much for doing this and, and being a part of this. And this is, um, you know, this is kind of our way of giving some sports content to people um, who've been quarantined at home. Sports has been missing from our lives. So I know listening to your story um, has just brought a little bit of joy to a lot of people. Thank you so much. All righty. Anytime. All right, great stuff from the champ. And now the moment that many of you have been waiting for, our favorite videos from our Gaming Together campaign in our partnership with the Houston Outlaws. Of course, we're encouraging everyone at home, whether you're gaming online, getting outside, whatever you can do to game together, take a video, send it in, and uh, we will show our favorites right here on the show. And here are this week's favorites. A little hamster in there. A little hamsters in there. And I ship in a bottle. Where'd you get the hamsters from? Um, the store. 
They just sold hamsters at the store? Yeah, I was moving them there. Why do you have a tissue box next to your bed? So I can have it when I cry. <laughs> Why are you crying? It's like your life. Chris gave it to me. Oh my god. No, 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 no! Get away from me! Get away from me! No! 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 Some people just can't play scary games. <laughs> We're getting schooled Wait, by the chefs. Wait, I did not know that there was no game sounds. I'm glad that you told me. Uh, pew, 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 my desk. Pew, pew. <laughs> we'll make them. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> now that you brought it to our attention, you're going to have some homemade game sounds. Ready? <laughs> pew, pew. Pew, pew. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you wanted? <laughs> <laughs> All right, keep those videos coming. Send them, upload them to the address you see right there on your screen. We enjoy seeing them. We hope you all have enjoyed this episode, and we will see you next week on Queued Up. Have a great week, everyone.